This is an analysis example of threaded fasteners looking at tensile loads. In this case, a zinc plated grade 2 1 half 13 UNC bolt and nut are used to permanently attach a half inch steel bracket to a 5 8 inch steel plate using a single washer under the head of the bolt. Using a design factor of 1.2, find the recommended preload and torque and the maximum safe static tensile load in the joint. We're going to start out, as with all problems, by identifying the variables that are given to us. We know that we have a grade 2 bolt. We are using zinc coating on the bolt. The bolt is a half inch diameter. The pitch is 1 13th of an inch. The desired design factor is 1.2. We are clamping a half inch, a 5 eighths inch, and a washer, all made of steel. What we're looking for then is the initial tension that we want to put in the joint or the pre joint preload, the torque required to achieve that initial tension, and the max static tensile load that can be applied after assembly before we encounter one of our failure modes. We need to assume that during assembly we're not going to fail. In other words, that the bolt is not over torqued or yielded during assembly. And we're also going to assume that thread stripping doesn't occur during assembly as well. For our solution process, we're going to start out by identifying the appropriate properties. Now we need to do some looking around for these because they come from different places. As you can see here, we're going to find the proof strength from table 8-9. And for a grade 2 bolt, that's 55 KSI. We also need to find the threaded cross-section of the joint, or the effective cross-sectional area that's used in tension in the threaded portion. So that's in table 8.2, and it's labeled as A sub T, so it's 0.1419 square inch. Then we need to know the factor that is used to convert from tension preload into the torque that we need to apply to the joint, and that's what we call K. It comes from table 815, and it ends up being 0.2 for a zinc-plated bolt. We should know the thickness of the washer that's in this joint up here. So that thickness is 0.095 inches, and it comes from table A32 in the appendix. Then we need to know the thickness of the nut that's on the bolt because we need to know the bolt length, and for that we need to know everything that's going that needs to be along the length of the bolt. So H is 7 16 of an inch. That comes from table A31. And lastly, of course, we need to know the stiffness of the material, the Young's modulus. That's 30 MSI um, coming from table A5, or hopefully from your memory, because that's one you should know for steel. Once we have all those properties, we move into directly finding the desired preload and the torque. So this is a pretty straightforward calculation once we have all these properties. To get the desired preload, we take the fact that it's a permanently attached joint, or it's, it's designed to be permanently attached. So that gives us a 90% factor on the preload. In other words, 90% of the proof load is what we use for our preload. So we take 0.9 times the proof strength of 55 KSI times the tensile cross-sectional area of 0.1419. That gives us approximately 7,000 pounds as our desired preload. If we then need to um, determine the torque that we want to apply to produce that 7,000 pounds, we'll take our factor K, multiply it by the nominal diameter of our bolt, little d, which of course was given to us as a half inch, and the Fi that we just found. So that gives us 700 inch pounds for the torque that will produce 7,000 pounds of preload. So that's actually our first set of answers. Now the rest is a little bit more lengthy. We need to go through the process of finding out the stiffness in the joint. And we'll start out by determining how long this, this bolt needs to be to do this clamping. So first off, we need to choose a bolt length that's greater than the grip. The grip is the clamped area of the joint. So in this case, it consists of the uh, washer thickness and the two plate thicknesses added together. I'll get that in a moment. Um, H, then the length, uh, or the thickness rather, of the nut. And then uh, it's a good recommendation that you want to leave a couple of threads outside of the nut once you've tightened it down. So I'm going to use two times the pitch to allow me to have two threads out there. That's a recommendation. So the grip is then a half inch for the steel bracket, 5 eighths inch for the steel plate, and 0.095 inch for the washer. All told, it's 1.22 inches. I put that in, so that gives me a length has to be greater than 1.81 inch. You go back to, take to the 
table A17, which gives you standard sizes, and I see that the next standard size up from 1.81 is going to be 2 inches. So this needs to be a 2 inch bolt. Now I need to determine what portion of the grip is threaded and what portion is unthreaded because those are two different spring stiffnesses um, and I'm going to need to combine them. So to find out the threaded and unthreaded grip, I need to first figure out how much of this bolt is actually threaded. We have an equation from the book that tells us that for a standard threaded fastener, you take two times the diameter plus a quarter inch and that gives you the threaded length of the bolt. So one and a quarter inches is the threaded length. The rest of it is shank, so it's at the nominal diameter. The, then the shank portion is just going to be the total length minus the threaded length of the bolt, or three quarters of an inch. Then the portion of the threaded length that is within the joint, so the portion that's being stretched, is the total grip minus the portion of the grip that was shank, or 0.47 inches. Those are the key lengths that I need to determine. Now, I need to know the cross-sectional area in the threaded portion and also the cross-sectional area in the shank portion. I already had the threaded portion cross-section as 0.1419. Now I get the shank cross-section as um, 1 quarter pi d squared, d being the nominal or outside dimension for the bolt, and that's 0.196 inch squared. Next, I look for the bolt stiffness. And here I'm doing the um, inverse sum of the stiffnesses, and I'm just going to use the equation from the book that already combines those. So the total bolt stiffness is the inverse sum of the threaded and the unthreaded portion, which gives me a total bolt, bolt stiffness of 4.2 megapounds per inch. Now I need to look at the rest of the joint. So the material has its own stiffness. We are fortunate in this case, and often this is true, that all the material is steel that we're clamping. As a result, we can use some simplified formulas. The first one I'll show here is from the book, um, taking into account the known angles of the threads, <clears throat> as well as the fact that all the materials are the same thickness. And I have this formula for Km. I'm not going to read that off. You can see it's, it's fairly complicated. You should look in the section of the book where this is developed. This, this equation then gives me 15.2 megapounds per inch for the material thickness. So what we have here in this joint, of course, is a, a bolt in tension. That's one of my springs. And we have material in compression. That's my other spring. And these springs are working together to carry any additional load that comes into the joint. We have another approach, since this is all one material. There is a formula Km equals AED times the exponential of BD over the grip, L. And that, if I use that formula with the A and the B for steel that come from cable 88, then you get a um, bolt, or I'm sorry, material stiffness of 15.3 megapounds per inch. So virtually the same answer. So either one of these is appropriate. Both of these are simplified versions that um, acknowledge the fact that it's all steel that you're dealing with. Okay, next, if we look at the joint factor, which is what we need to determine the portion of the load that I subsequently add to the system that is going to go into the bolt or the portion that goes into the material. C is actually the portion that goes into the bolt. So it's the proportion of stiffness. Remember this from statics. The um, load goes proportional to the stiffness of a uh, dual path. And in this case, I can either have the load going to the material or I can have it going to the bolt. Um, the portion going to the bolt is proportional to its stiffness. So C is equal to KB divided by KB plus KM, and that's equal to 0.215. So in other words, 21.5% of any subsequent loading is going to go into increasing the tension in the bolt, and the remaining 78.5% is going to go into decreasing the compression in the joint. So moving forward then, now I've got enough information to go and look at my failure modes. And the specific failure modes are joint opening. That's my first one. Let's see, to evaluate joint opening, we've got an equation in the book, which, is, which comes from our expression for the bolt force. And if we say that we want the, I'm sorry, this expression comes from the material force, the compression in the joint. 
If we want that compression to equal zero, then we end up with this equation for PO. So the max uh, force that's allowed before we open up the joint is going to be equal to the initial tension divided by a safety factor times 1 minus C. In this case, we use the design factor of 1.2, and it tells us that the maximum load before joint opening is 7430 pounds. Now, the other major failure mode we need to consider is that the bolt is going to yield. And in the bolt yielding, we have a formula for the proof strength being equal to C, again, the joint factor, times the load factor, N sub L. Again, I'll use 1.2 for that times the max load that I can apply for yielding, plus Fi divided by A sub T. Rearrange terms, plugging in the appropriate values for SP and AT and Fi, and I find that the max load before yielding of my bolt will occur is 3120 pounds. So naturally, we take the smaller of those two loads as our limiting tensile load. So in this case, I can take 3120 pounds before bolt yielding occurs, I'm nowhere close to joint opening at that level. So a brief reflection here, the higher bolt preload, and here we had a 90% preload, that tends to increase the factor of safety on the joint opening condition. Um, so in this case, if I had lowered that preload, perhaps down to 0.85 or 0.8, that would allow the bolt yielding force to get higher, and it would reduce the bolt's or the joint opening force. So if you want to optimize your joint, you can choose a preload. If you set NO, so the opening safety factor, equal to N sub L, and then use that equation to solve for FI, that will give you your optimal initial preload for your joint.